Yo, what up? This is Josh Rumor from East West Sailing and Performance, and today I'm going to contradict myself. Well, I don't know if I'm going to contradict myself, because I've done to YouTube, a YouTube series on the dangers of iron. And you can actually find the dangers of iron 1 and 2 right there. And watch those. But I think this video is more of a lesson of how everything we do is based on the person, and everything we do has to be individualized. I'm going to share this story towards the end of the YouTube, so if you want to fast forward it, you can. But I want to talk about, not the dangers of iron, but possibly, of course, I've talked about as we grow, you actually need it, infants need it, we can get it from our foods. But, based off the work of Hans Celier, Broda Barnes, Ray Pete, based off the work of Dr. Um, Bothorpe, Mary Shimon, they've shown, and I've talked about this in my Understanding the GI System Metabolically series, it's a three-part series, I'll actually put those... YouTube's in the description page below. But anytime the body is in a hypometabolic state, anytime we're, we could say we're hypothyroid. Now, I'm not a doctor. I don't like using that, that term. I like using the word hypometabolic. Our metabolism is actually not working the way it should. It's not using oxygen efficiently. It's not using sugars, T3, etc. And we're not producing energy. That's the bottom line. So we're in this hypometabolic state. The cells are the directors of what's going on in the other systems. Now, if we look at the GI system, it's been shown by those people that I mentioned that hydrochloric acid secretions, pancreatic enzymes, other digestive enzymes, etc., are actually downregulated because we're not producing enough energy at the cell level. We're in the survival state. And the body's not thinking about going to the bathroom or digesting food when we're in the survival state. It's thinking about fighting inflammation, regulating blood sugar, regulating energy production, um, fighting inflammation. And that's what's most important to it. It's not thinking about digesting food or going to the bathroom. So when these secretions are down-regulated, it's been shown that absorption is down-regulated. And it's been shown that these secretions are actually down-regulated by at least 50%. So we have a down-regulation of specific enzymes, hydrochloric acid. So now peristalsis is actually decreased, which can lead to constipation. This is why a lot of people in a hypometabolic state or hypothyroid get constipation. At the same time, absorption is actually decreased. So now we can't absorb the very nutrients and minerals from the foods that we're actually eating, which can lead to vitamin D deficiencies, B12 deficiencies, and iron deficiency anemia. Now, I actually talked to Ray Pete about this, and he says it's actually rare, but it is common in people. Now, I want to share a story. Of course, you can base it off labs. Now, I completely recommend that if you're going to take an iron supplementation, that you know what you're doing, you've done a lab, you know you're completely iron deficient anemia, and you've tried other scenarios, like I've talked about, I think, in my last video, um, you know, eating liver more often than what we recommend. We recommend three to six ounces per week. So eating liver, what I recommend, is three, three ounces per day. Making sure that you actually have orange juice around the times you eat meat or muscle meats and eat liver to increase iron absorption. Decrease the amount of caffeine you're taking in or actually decrease it because it actually can decrease iron absorption. Eliminating the use of aspirin that you're using for metabolic purposes or cell energy production purposes or for inflammation or for aromatase inhibit, inhibitation, whatever the word is. Because it's been shown that aspirin in any dose can actually lower uh, iron serum, uh, uh, serum iron levels. So there's things that you can do to increase your iron levels without taking the supplement. Because some people don't want to do that. Now, based off a lab, you know what's going on. You know your iron deficient anemia. Now, I don't like talking symptoms, but what I've seen in patients that are truly iron deficient anemia is they've done the nutrition philosophy, and I highly recommend this before you even start with supplements, you know. And I'm giving you my, this is based off a client I was working with for about a year. Um, they've really been logging their foods. They were doing great. And then they started to get chronic fatigue. Temps started to suffer, and they had shortness of breath, respiratory issues. We tried regulating the ratios, the frequencies, nothing worked. We thought based on the symptoms and based off what we read, because if you can't absorb your nutrients, you can't absorb iron. This is why in some people you see iron deficient anemia, or just an iron deficiency with hypothyroid people. So we tried increasing liver intake to three to six ounces per day, increased... Um, the intake of vitamin C around those times to increase iron absorption, eliminated aspirin, eliminated caffeine, did another lab over time. It really didn't help at all. If anything, her levels went down. So then we actually tried using small amounts of desiccated liver supplement along with the foods. So let me rewind it a little bit and give you some things that you need to look at when it comes to a lab. You have to look at everything. You can't just look at ferritin or iron and say, I'm iron deficient anemia. You have to look at a lot of things. Of course, you have to look at all the thyroid levels, TSH, free T3, free T4, T3, T4, 
TPO, etc. And you have to correlate them with copper. Copper and iron actually have an antagonistic view. Now, and I don't want to go through the, the you know, ins and outs of this, but just give you some input. Copper is important for iron uptake and utilization. So people that are copper deficient can have high iron, or people that are actually, through the foods they're eating, taking in too much copper can actually downregulate iron absorption. So that's one thing you need to look at because you can offset that antagonism by decreasing the amount of copper that you're taking in with the types of foods that you're taking in. You need to look at iron metabolism on the lab. Now this is basically looking at total serum iron. I have a lot of notes here. This, I can't remember all this stuff. Serum ferritin, total iron binding capacity, transferrin saturation, MCV, RDW, and hematocrit. So these, these are the things you need to look at, and this is why. So total serum iron. Now 70% of the iron in the body is stored as hemoglobin. The remaining 30% is in the liver, spleen, and bone marrow. Foods that inhibit absorption in the duodenum and the, in the jejunum are coffee, tea, meat, and vitamin C. So based off that indirectly right there, you know that if you have low iron levels, you can actually um, use those foods to increase iron absorption, like vitamin C. You can decrease the amount of coffee that you're taking in, etc. The majority of dietary iron is in the form of ferric iron, which is reduced to ferrous iron after digestion in order to be absorbed, a process that requires hydrochloric acid and vitamin C, based off the work of Dr. Weatherby. So when you look at this level, the, the total serum iron um, percentage, if it's low, it could be many things. And on a blood lab, you're looking at, it could be malabsorption, it could actually be increased because of pregnancy, it can be from decrease, decreased hydrochloric acid, or even being on your menses, a need for vitamin C, hypothyroidism, and possible liver dysfunction. Now you can look at serum ferritin, which is the major storage of iron or the major site of iron storage in the body. It's decrease in the serum parallels tissue levels. Um, and if it's low, you're looking at basically iron deficient anemia from conversion issues or excess parathyroid uh, production, which we've talked about is in excess anytime we're inflamed or have a calcium deficiency, we can actually downregulate that with eggshells and the right types of foods over time. So I'll put our eggshell YouTube down below as well. You need to look at total iron binding capacity, which is basically look at, looking at transferrin, which is produced by the liver. It carries iron, it basically carries iron in the blood. And anytime you see uh, an increase in total iron binding capacity, you know that your iron levels are low. Low can be from excess absorption of iron, pro, uh, protein um, maldigestion or malnutrition, not getting enough, chronic inflammation or liver dysfunctions. But at the same time, you can get a false reading because oral contraceptives can actually increase this reading, which can give you a false reading of actually having low iron. Another value that you need to look at is percent transferrin saturation, which is a calculated index of iron saturation um, than transferrin levels. It's more sensitive screening for iron than serum iron or TIBC. A lot of the times when it's low, you're looking at an iron deficiency anemia chronic infection, and at the same time, you can see these levels actually be um, low because of pregnancy, so you can get a false reading. You're looking at MCV, it's another value you want to look at. I'll get to my client's um, uh, story towards the end, but I'm just giving you the values you need to look at because it's important. I don't recommend people just taking iron because I've talked about the dangers of it or trying to increase their iron levels without truly knowing if they're actually iron deficient anemia, anemic. So MCV, it's one of the red blood cells indices used to differentiate anemias. It's measuring volume of a single red blood cell. Always consider MCH with MCV to determine vitamin B6, B12, or folic acid defici deficiency anemia. And always refer to albumin, and I've talked about that in regards to estrogen, how that affects albumin and affects blood volume and detoxification. Um... At the same time, calcium is actually bound to albumin, which will lower calcium levels, which will increase parathyroid hormone, which I talked about about two minutes ago. A lot of the times with MCV, you'll see low readings with iron deficiency anemia from malabsorption. You can see the correlation here from blood loss, B6 deficiency, um, heavy metal burden, or from free radicals. And the, one of the most important ones you need to correlate with is hematocrit. So you don't just look at one of these and go, I'm iron deficient anemia. You have to look at all of them. 
So you have to look at hematocrit. It's a volume of red blood cells. Now, there's some things that can cause a false reading, like high altitude and dehydration. Um, but a lot of the times, if hematocrit is low, you're looking at some sort of anemia. Um, a lot of the times, you need to correlate it with decreased hemoglobin, decreased red blood cells in this decreased hematocrit. And a lot of times, that's those three are an indication of a deficiency in iron, or B12, folate, B6, and copper, or blood loss if someone had an injury or they're giving lots of blood. Because everyone thinks you need to give lots of blood to lower your iron levels. Could be from digestive inflammation, thymus hypofunction, free radicals, or adrenal hypofunction. Now, my point in this is it's very important to know who you're working with, yourself or a client, and what you're doing with them. Because everyone out there wants to use aspirin. Aspirin for this, aspirin for that. Ray P recommends aspirin. I need to take it. But there's a problem with this. Because if you're taking it and you're already iron deficient, deficient anemia, it's actually going to push you more iron deficient anemia. This is a huge example of why we always say everything is person specific and it's hard to give exact recommendations on YouTube, on Facebook, on our blog, etc. A lot of people get annoyed with that. Well, that's okay. The bottom line is this is a great example of looking at the person and understanding who you're working with and using what's most important no matter what anyone else says. Because based on this person that I'm talking about, they were getting tons of results with just foods. Then over time, you know, we added aspirin, we added these things, and things started to go south. So we did a lab, we found out she was iron deficient anemia, anemia. We tried increasing liver intake every day, three ounces to six ounces per day, increased meat intake. Of course, there was other food things going on there nutritionally with frequency and ratios. We increased how she actually used vitamin C around these foods, decreased the amount of caffeine, cut out the aspirin, and over time things were not getting better. So she did another lab. Well, a lot of these levels were actually low. Her hematocrit, her total iron, iron saturation, etc. Now, using the food recommendations that I talked about, in adding in only 40, I think it was 40 milligrams, yeah, 40 milligrams a day of um, gluconate ferrous and iron and three ounces of liver per day, drinking orange juice, avoiding coffee, and avoiding calcium within two hours of taking the iron, within six weeks, all these levels actually regulated, and she was actually feeling tremendously better. Now, according to the Journal of American Journal of Medicine, it's common practice, a generic recommendation in adults to recommend 150 to 200 milligrams of elemental iron per day. Now, we have to think about the absorption. Is the person actually absorbing this? Now, I feel that taking in that much iron in a pill form can actually be reduced by looking at how much, you know, liver, meats, how you're drinking orange juice around this time, because you're going to get the other milligrams you need. And if we can give, the goal is to give the person as little as possible to get the best result. So we didn't want to recommend 150 to 200 milligrams. Other research says 180 milligrams per day is the most important. But after six weeks of only ingesting 40 milligrams of iron per day, increasing her liver to three to six ounces per day, now we usually recommend three to six ounces a week, drinking orange juice around this time and avoiding coffee, it only took six weeks to actually regulate her levels. Her hematocrit went up uh, like eight, seven, six, like five or six points, total iron went up like 40 points, iron saturate, saturation went up almost 20 points, and that's in six weeks. So you can see how it's very important to, A, know who you are and what's going on, log your foods so you understand what's going on and take your body temperature and pulse. Stay tuned to what's going on. Try foods first. If foods aren't working, you can do a lab. Look at the lab and look at everything on the lab and not just one value. And based on that, if you feel you need the supplement, which I'm not recommending everyone take. Some people can actually, I've had people that had actually an iron deficient anemia that actually can use the liver every day, you know, the orange juice, and actually can get the benefit, but this person didn't. And by adding in only 40 milligrams a day per six weeks, she was actually able to regulate based on a, a, a recent lab, all these different levels, hematocrit, etc., and push herself over that hump to the point now she doesn't need to take the, the liver um, supplement anymore. And she's actually using foods and is going to do another lab, and once those foods, reg the lab regulates even more, she's actually going to decrease the amount of liver she takes in, not drink orange juice around that time, 
drink coffee, not take aspirin, and just use food to continually heal her metabolism. So I hope this YouTube wasn't all over the place. I hope it makes sense. I hope it's a great example of how we need to look at the person that's in front of us. And everything we do and every recommendation and every supplement we take and every food we take has to be based on the person, their logs, their body temperature, pulse, and their labs if they do labs. Thanks for tuning in, and I'm out of here.